happy Republic Day. Oh, thank you. Exactly. Look, we can't sit in... Okay. We have to keep a certain distance here. Yeah. And we can't see the audience. We can't, well. also, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly two years ago on this day, we inaugurated the first Kolkata Literary you, you, you inaugurated it with uh, Shunilda, and you had spoken about uh, you know, the freedom of expression being compromised in India. So exactly two years later, we're talking about another freedom, you know, the freedom to love. So are you worried about the Republic on the Republic Day? I think mean, that's... Uh... Well, I, I certainly remember when I when I came two years ago, Sunil got Congo Party High who wrote, you know, as everyone knows, Prathamalo and Shay Shame and other great books. Um, uh, Mal uh, Malvika uh, got us to do calligraphy on either side of the stage. Uh, I did mine in, in, in Arabic or Urdu, and he did call or more, right? And, uh, you know, yeah, um, on the other side, and uh, wh one of the interesting things, uh, if I remember right, about reading uh, uh, one of uh, which, which, which was those days, yeah, Shay Shaman, um, there were some very interesting passages about the great Bengali writer Michael Madhusudan Dutta and his uh, uh, deep affection for for uh, for another man. So it is kind of curious, though. Sunil can't be here today, and I hope he's, if not in the audience, floating somewhere around listening to us. But I took a great deal of. Uh, Apart from that, one of the ideas that people are always saying is, oh, it's not very Indian. Of course, it's completely Indian. It's just a human aspect of life. So I do think that I'm a little worried that certain kinds of intolerance are growing. Uh, intolerance against people of different religions, intolerance, uh, as we can see, against people who marry or, or have an affair outside their particular caste, uh, people who have an affair outside their or inside their village. Um, people who have an affair with someone of their say, of their own gender. I mean, this kind of thing. Why get bothered with other people's lives? Now, as for the republic itself, the republic also suffers from lots of other problems: corruption, uh, poverty, uh, hundreds of other ailments and ills. Um, but uh, to take an American uh, uh, expression, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can tackle several problems at the same time and the fact that one problem is important doesn't lessen the significance of another. But isn't that what many people are saying that in a country that's beset with problems this this particular one which affects a tiny... You better tiny explain the, to the audience what the particular problem is. This is about uh, the... I, I, know, I know your mother's in the audience and your father <laughs> but you better explain no, it. I think I'll leave that to you. It's about... I, I think everyone here knows what it is. It's about uh, criminalizing certain uh, c certain private lives, uh, parts of our private... You must do this. This is ridiculous. Right, okay, my parents okay. are in the audience and so, I, so is my mother-in-law. Um, well, um, if you could cover those six years... Uh, <laughs> oh, don't bother. Um, basically, uh, this session has partly been caused... Uh, I, I was going to give another session anyway, and I shall be a couple of days from now which will concentrate more about my writing and so on. This will certainly touch upon, to some extent, my writing, but only insofar as it really uh, concerns the issue at hand. Now, what is the issue at hand? The issue at hand is uh, something called uh, Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. This is a, 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 a section which was introduced as part of our criminal law uh, in 1860 or 61 by uh, a committee consisting, among other things, of Lord Macaulay, the famous poet, um, who uh, was uh, pretty illiberal in many ways because he was part of the Victorian tradition, uh, the Victorian ethos. Um, and uh, the, I shall recite the clause. Whoever voluntarily commits intercourse against the order of nature with man woman or animal shall be sentenced to imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description, that means rigorous or simple, for a term that may extend to 10 years and also be liable to fine. I, I, I'm not sure where the fine comes in, but at any rate. Um, now, unfortunately, though four years ago this section was uh, decriminalized or read down 
to the extent that private, adult, consensual acts were, you know, sexual acts were fine. Um, about a month ago, on the 11th of the 12th of yes, the 13th, 11, 12, um, the Supreme Court, like another two judges, decided that they were going to recriminalize all these acts. So if anyone has ever had uh, oral sex with his wife, for example, he should consider that he could be in um, Do you think I should take a poll of the audience or should I spare your feelings? Um, <laughs> I mean, the recriminalization of this would be laughable if only it were not so tragic. Because it is mainly used against gay people. Mainly against gay men to uh, um, brutalize them, to harass them, to torture them in police uh, cells, to rape them as well, um, and to uh, blackmail them, and to threaten them in various ways but also against women. Uh, uh, women who live together have been torn apart by their families or by the police uh, under the instigation of their families. So this is a pernicious law which has had terrible effects on a lot of people. And uh, your remark, uh, Malvika, is not correct that it is a minuscule uh, uh, do you say a tiny it's number? Tiny, tiny percentage. It is not a tiny percentage. If human beings uh, living in India are roughly the same as human beings living in the rest of the world, uh, it would be at a very minimum 5% of the population. That is an extremely conservative figure. Multiply that by a billion, let's not even say 1.2 billion, but say 1 billion, that's 50 million people. That's the population of Karnataka, that's the population of Gujarat, the population of England or Italy or France or Madhya Pradesh. It is not a small number and that is only the people involved. It doesn't include their families, say the, the, the women whom a man is forced to marry, the man whom a woman is forced to marry, the families, the brothers, the sisters, people who are concerned and who love them. So it is a absolutely, uh, it's a very serious problem, a very large problem uh, to do with basically the happiness of millions and millions of people. And sadly, one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, aspects of the judgment by the two judges of the Supreme Court uh, was that, oh well, it's a minuscule number and therefore uh, the law doesn't need to bother about their fundamental rights. Now, as I pointed out, it is not minuscule. But supposing it were minuscule. Like the Parsis, your mother has mentioned Yes, that. my mother this morning wrote an article about it in the newspaper. She was a judge uh, and a chief justice of, a, of the High Court and a member of the Law Commission. The she wrote very much against the grain an article in today's Times of India in which she said, um, this argument, it appears to me, is constitutionally immoral and inhumane because it would say, in effect, that it is up to Parliament to decide whether the entire community of the Parsis could be imprisoned or deported, let's say, because they only number a few tens of thousands, which is, of course, a minuscule proportion of the Indian population. You can imagine what that sort of argumentation uh, would lead to. In this particular case, I say it is n not minuscule at all, but even if it were, it would be reprehensible that judicial, fusilan, you know, ju judicial, let's say, abdication of responsibility is trying to push it back to Parliament when it is absolutely the province of the Supreme Court to decide what our fundamental rights are to privacy, to dignity, to freedom, to non-discrimination, that covers Articles 15, 6, 14, 15, and 21, and, um, and basically the right to love. Why should one take permission from their lordships when deciding whom to fall in love with, or whom to love, or whom to make love with? So, uh, you know, you've, you've mentioned in your article, in the, the India Today article, which, you know, everyone speaks about, that uh, this is, uh, you know, another, it, it's another sign of the times. You've compared it to the Khap Panchayats. But none of that ever made you come out and protest. You know, why, why this, but, I mean, obviously you were one of the people who your community, the gay community would look up to to protest. But those were also burning issues. So what made think, you, yeah. somebody who fiercely guards your privacy, you know, come out and do covers and do interviews? Oh. Um, 
Let me just make this a little Socratic. Malvika, have you ever protested against anything in your life? About, yeah, the Mandel Commission. The Mandel Commission. <laughs> yeah, I walked to the parliament from South Bay. And nothing else? I protest every day in small ways. Something Give me an shocking. example. Actually, nothing springs to mind. Nothing springs to mind. Okay, now if I were to ask you why you haven't pro protested against poverty, against uh, the raping of tribal women, and why you only protested against Mandel, what would your answer be? That seemed to affect a few of my friends, and they felt so strongly about it. And I thought that was also, you know, it was a form of, there was natural justice involved in that particular. And there was no justice involved in the question of women being raped, uh, you know, arbitrarily. The point really I'm trying to make is this, that one cannot, one has a short life, one cannot protest against any, everything. One has to eventually husband one's energies and what, and where one thinks one can do best. If you just become the standard signatory or the standard marcher of a hundred protests, to some extent you're diluting the efficacy of what you can do. Now in this particular case, people like me, let's say, you know, are somewhat, somewhat protected, I'd say. Though if you look at the use of laws such as this in, for example, Malaysia, where the uh, uh, leader of the opposition was locked up for years in on end because of a case of this sort, simply because uh, Mahathir uh, wanted to do that. And now recently in Sri Lanka, uh, the leader of the, um, well, the, one of the leaders of the opposition, basically the ex-foreign minister who's fallen out with the president, uh, is being threatened quite directly with a case of this sort being instituted. You can see how it can be used against your political opponents, against anyone. Now there's going to be a huge age of um, wiretapping especially if we get the kind of prime ministership that we might get, what happened in Gujarat is going to be repeated all over the country. The, everyone has done something that they can be afraid of. Everyone has knows someone whom they love, a brother or a sister, who has done something for which pressure can be put on the person. This will certainly be, I would imagine, used because for example, um, the BJP has come out straight and said, yes, people should be imprisoned for the rest of their lives if they have consensual oral sex. They should. This is the official policy of the BJP. Ramdev Baba says so, Rajat Singh says so, and Modi, very interestingly, doesn't say anything. He's tweeted about everything in the world, but here he wants to be very clear that he's a modernist. He doesn't want, he's hiding behind the pallu of basically these other people because he wants people to think he's a modernist. He doesn't want to say, no, any man who's uh, made love with his wife in, 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 in a particular way other than should be jailed. He wants to make sure that he has uh, people whom he can infect, um, uh, treat as a minority and treat as an antagonistic minority. Um, so with regard to why I decided to say something about this, the, the reason really was this. You're quite right. I don't really... Um, I am much more private by nature than I would say many writers um, who feel and I would say in many ways quite rightly feel that you should as a writer be at the Zolaistic like at the forefront of, 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 of changes and of uh, uh, attitudes uh, and of movements um, and so on. I husband my privacy, I... But when something like this happened, which really surprised me, when the cogency and the humanity and the learning of the Delhi High Court judgment was set aside by what I could see as very, very poor and shoddy argumentation, so that it was not just ethically hollow, but it was, Im uh, it was not just ethically sh hollow, but, in, but how would you say, intellectually shallow, I just felt I had to speak out. It seemed to me that not only had the Supreme Court disgraced itself, and I hope very much that they can correct it, perhaps they can, um, but that really so many people who couldn't defend themselves in the way that people who are privileged like me to some extent can, you know, um, would be, continue to live lives of absolutely quiet desperation. I mean, some poor kid in a Kasba town or in a, in a village or with a family who's less broad-minded than, than mine, and God knows my family had a tough time with it, um, wouldn't, would be 
bewildered. For them, a decision, a judgment like this would come like a disaster. Because not only can they bring you know, the whole weight of uh, conservatism against this person and say, look, give us grandchildren, marry the girl no matter how miserable you make her, we don't care, etc., etc. But now, bitterly, the weight of the law is against them and the stigma of criminalization. And it's no light criminalization, it is a felony of the most serious kind, which is used and has been used, and since the judgment has again been used against people. Well, you just, at the start of your argument, you mentioned that, you know, you know, many people protest about many things, and there has been a huge protest against this particular case as well. But uh, do you think, to my surprise, but it has been amazing. But uh, we are going through this protest phase of our country, so you know people are just jumping from one protest to the other. So do you think, you know, this kind of outcry would soon be, you know, a new issue will come up and this will be forgotten? Do you think that is a possibility? It and is possible. Of course, I could it put is. Put another question, or do you want to answer this first? I'd rather answer a question one at a time. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, I find I answer them backwards. Yeah. But say, just to, to answer this question, yes, it is always possible. I mean, the the uh, interests of the audience of any 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 group of people is fickle. I notice it in myself, for example. You know, I I tend to go from one day's news to the next. I I feel happy about something, outraged by another thing. Uh, we aren't you know children who suddenly can be distracted uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, or, or told, look darling, I know you're getting an injection in this arm, but look at that butterfly over there. Yes. No, it's not quite like that. But yes, certainly, there are so many pressing matters in our polity, it is certainly possible. But that doesn't reduce the injustice, or the extent of the injustice, or the fact that it affects so very, very many people. Okay, and uh, the second part of it is that, uh, you know, once you came out so vociferously and so prominently against this, the, the community that we were looking to for a protest, that is the gay community, the people who are in influential positions from that community, were you a little underwhelmed by their response that they didn't you know, join you at the forefront of this protest? Well, look, I'm not an advocate. Everything I did, including the cover, for example, of India, India Today, and not, I won't say I'm not an advocate in the standard sense. I don't know many people in the, in the, uh, in, 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 how would you say, the, the, the movement. Uh, uh, but I would say that these people deserve a great amount of credit. I mean, in a sense, to some extent, I could say I'm a comparative Johnny come lately to this thing. I did something in 2006, and again, I was so incensed and upset by the implications of the judgment for so many people who really cannot defend themselves that I decided to do something. But the people who deserve real credit for this are people who stuck through thick and thin and through a number of very disappointing uh, judgments uh, by the ha Delhi High Court, which then went up to the Supreme Court, a number of disappointments for a dozen years. You know, the Nas Foundation, um, which is actually, I think, founded by a, a straight woman, as it happens. But uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Lawyers Collective, uh, Voices Against 377, many courageous people who have actually, you know, uh, run the gamut of, 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 of what's happened. Um, so, uh, as far as... I've almost lost track of your question, what was it? Do you think the community... You know, was, the, was I underwhelmed? Opinion, yes. Yes. Was I underwhelmed? Well, look, you can't force people to come out. People will do it at their own time. As I said, I went, I've described what went through my head. I couldn't, you know, watch m my own unshaven face in the mirror. Um, and, and, and eventually I just felt there was no way I could face myself and not speak out. But, um, well, there are people, of course, in, you know, in the film world, in, in business, and in, in, in many other professions, who um, it would be, give a great deal of encouragement to people who are lonely and isolated and don't understand themselves and are trying to come to terms with themselves if they had these people as role models, regardless of whether the Supreme Court two days from now on the 28th uh, reverses or at least considers the possibility of reversing its judgment. Regardless of that, there's a societal question as well. India had a much, much more tolerant uh, view of these things. You can see it throughout our history, both Islamic and Hindu history, before 1861. But once that became the law, it became very difficult to, to change it in Parliament, which is rather a majoritarian uh, institution. 
but it is definitely within the province of the High Court and the Supreme Court to turn it uh, down. So can you talk us through what will happen on the 28th? You know? Well, um, it's a little technical, but shall I, I, I let it basically, I what, what happens is this. Um, as you know, if there's a law in India where, which is contrary to the provisions of the Constitution, then that law has to be either struck down because it goes against the fundamental rights or some other provision in the Constitution, or it has to be read down. And by reading down, what you mean is that it has to be um, edited in such a way that it falls within the four corners of the Constitution. Now, with Section 377, um, the non-consensual part or the non-adult part will still stands. It is only the consensual part, which is no longer, the High Court decided it was no longer criminalizable, the consensual adult private part. <coughs> now, what's happened is that the Supreme Court says that the section stands in its entirety. So regardless of consent, regardless of the fact that both people involved are adults, regardless of the fact that it's private, it is still criminal and should be criminal unless Parliament decides not to make it so.